No, that's okay. It, I think it happens automatically for some, depending on which version of Zoom you got. So don't feel bad. Um, and that, Carly, that's also for you. Can you please mute? And then, Cypria, it's all yours. Okay, amazing. So we're just jogging our memory as to where we are. Welcome to Three Jewels. Welcome to ACI 17. So we are in the second of a Firehose Dharma review course, which is basically moving our minds together through the essential ideas to go from normal mind, normal existence to something beyond normal. Ex not even extra normal, just outside of normal. You can call it enlightenment. You can call it waking up. But what we're going to talk about tonight, and I'm so excited for that, is what is that like as an actual experience? Are these just things we're talking about to believe in or to debate or to intellectualize? Or in this very class, in these very words, is there a code that you can actually create an experience of waking up for you, for real? As real as the most stressful moment of your day today was, that real. Yeah, and so this first two classes, we're on the second class of reviewing Diamond Cutter, the Diamond Cutter Sutra, uh, which we cover in an entire course, so 10 classes, we're condensing it into just two classes. We're on the second one today. And it's honestly such an essential launch pad before we get into the rest of the material, right? Because the essential idea in this class in this course is capital E emptiness. And we're gonna, we talked about it last time, we're going to talk about it again. And if we can wrap our minds around that as something that's available to us, something that we can work with that could actually transform absolutely everything, all the other things are going to make sense. You know, if, if, if without the emptiness side, there's really no point in making the promises of a bodhisattva. There's no point in studying death in the realms. All the other things are gonna to start to fall into place. So I just wanna bring us back to where we left off, which felt like a long time ago, but just a week and a half, we were talking about the emptiness of everything, right? Big loaded word, but simply acknowledging that I, you, all of us hold all these assumptions about the world, right? We go around assuming that things are the way they are. My mom growing up used to tell my sister and I that when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. And I think about that a lot. I think it applies here, right? The concept of emptiness is saying, stop making an ass out of you and me and realize that your assumptions about the way the world appears and seems to be is not the truth of how things actually are. Because you step into someone else's completely valid view of the world and it's not that way for them. So I hope we actually got to play with that a little bit in this past week. I was thinking of it in regard to the day that happened last Thursday, right? This, the day that we decide to call Thursday and then we decide to put a date on it and call it Thanksgiving. I wonder for all of us on this call, how, for how many of us is that, this, is that day, this cherished family holiday, this memory of good times? I already see some people shaking their head. For some people, it's probably the commemoration of a genocide feast, right? And for real, that's the way you relate to that day. Now, you might laugh when we do the pen example and we say, who's right? Is it a chew toy or is it a pen? Who's right, the dog or the human? Who's right? Is it a cherished family holiday or is it a genocide feast? A mind imbued with emptiness, it's not saying it's nothing, it's saying it is something, and that something is a product of what was in that mind before. So you grew up having cherished holiday memories of that day, of relating to it in that way, of course it's going to come up for you that way. Or you grew up or, or decided to encode different imprints in your mind. Think of it like an algorithm. I've been thinking of karma that way. You're putting all these inputs in through what you think, through what you say, what you do, what you observe. You're putting all these inputs in. There's going to be an output 
and it's directly correlated to what you're putting in. The algorithm is perfect. There's no big tech giants tinkering with it. So you all had an experience last Thursday that now, now the thing is, and here's where the three spheres came in, right? If you were here for the three spheres of giving, and we're gonna go into that again tonight, the way you related with absolutely everything last Thursday is going to put into motion the way you relate to Thanksgiving, this thing we call Thanksgiving, next year. You put in a cause now, the result comes later. And no one was in your mind that day other than you. So you can ask yourself, maybe you had a small gathering where you fed people. And in your mind, as you were serving people, were you thinking, oh, I hope they take that piece but leave the corner slice for me because I really like the corner slice. Maybe that's what was going through your mind. Or were you thinking, as this person eats this thing which is empty of a nature, there's no goodness in it, in the thing itself, in that act, perhaps could everyone in the universe find nourishment? It's up to you. There's something you're doing to relate in that moment and the premise here is that it matters. Absolutely everything matters. Janine, you made it despite all technical issues. So I wanna bring our minds back to the three spheres of, uh, related to giving. I don't think it's a coincidence that Thanksgiving happened, that today is Giving Tuesday. Hopefully you're like, oh, cool, giving. This, this G word kept popping up and maybe you started thinking about it in a different way. Maybe it's not just a dollar that you donated or a dollar that you shopped with. Maybe it's something else. Because things aren't the way they are from their own side. We're going to get into it more, but hopefully this is starting to pull you back to where we were at. And with that, let's formally set a motivation. I want to show you one little code in here in the second page, actually, so that this doesn't just become this ritual that we're doing. This little clue, hopefully you see in the second stanza by the power of the goodness that I do in giving and the rest. Clue, we talked about the, the perfection of giving, right? If you remember, that was a list of one thing from six. That's exactly what this line is talking about. So any realizations you had around giving and the rest, the other five, we're gonna talk about another one of them today, actually, it's the perfection of patience. It's the story of the Buddha in a former lifetime. We're gonna go into it. But what we're doing right now is you can do this. You can scan through the last week and a half of your mind stream, the thoughts that no one else could hear. And really think what, what was the flavor of those? Like what were the most beautiful ones? What were the most hideous ones? And what would it feel like if in that mind instead it was sheer perfection? How that perfected mind, no problems, no worries, no doubts. See if you can actually conjure that up as we're doing this chanting and holding post, uh, postures with our hands. Oops. And I'm um, giving it away. And give it away as an offering. So for these next two hours. Wow, my computer's not cooperating. For these next two hours. Can that vision of a perfect world, a perfected mind that then creates that world, give it away in exchange for hearing the exact answers you need? That's my spiel. I wonder if Sachi and John Chris could lead us tonight. Would you like to? Sure. Thank you. Sashi kuki jukshin metok tram Rirad ning shi nyin de gen padi Sangye shindu mikte uwaki Drokun nam dak shin la chupar shok Iram Guru Ratna Manda Kamnyatayami
Sangire Chudam Soki Choknam La Jangchu Bardu Dakmi Kyapsu Chi Daki Chenyan Gipe Sinyam Ki Drola Pentir Sangye Drupar Sangye Chudam Soki Choknam La Jangchu Bardu Dakmi Kyapsu Chi Daki Chenyen Yi Pe Sinam Ki Drola Pentir Sangye Drupar Shok Sangye Chudam Soki Choknam La Jamshu Bardu Dakmi Kyapsu Chi Daki Chenyen Yi Pe Sinam Ki Drola Pentir Samye Drupar Shok Thank you. I'm going to let Hector take it away. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to fire hose wisdom. So I need you to wake up, be present, ignore the rest of your room. I'd like to invite you to think about a couple of things tonight. We're going to cover emptiness, 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 and everything else we do because of emptiness. Yeah. So what Supriya said at the beginning is vital because if we misunderstand emptiness, if we think emptiness is something it's not, doesn't matter all the other garbage we do to be nice people and meditate and do all if we're meditating on the wrong thing you're going to get the wrong result it's pretty clear and pretty logical so it's incumbent on us to try and understand get close to approximate our understanding of emptiness which is called it's a synonym for ultimate reality the way things really capital r are and remember, we talked so many times about we have biases, we have human biases, we see pens, dogs see chew toys, who's right? Both are right if you want to remain human or if you want to remain dog. Neither are right if you're looking at what the bloody thing actually is without humans, without dogs. What is that thing? And it's dependent, origination, dependent origination, it's dependent on the mind perceiving it. So bear with me remain connected we're trying to understand in the diamond cutter sutra buddha's words on emptiness and you'll peel a layer you'll go i got it and then it'll fade away disappear like the mists of avalon and then you're like i don't understand anything anything at all i don't understand anymore and then you'll be making efforts toward it towards it and you're like i get it so here's a map a really simplistic map of every single buddhist practice it's not even Buddhist, right? Because Buddha didn't think, oh, I'm a Buddhist. We're wake upists. We're trying to wake up Buddha to the capital R reality because we're fooled by the illusion. We're tricked. We're hypnotized by the little R reality. The view of humans only is not the way things are. So we'll make human mistakes like dogs make dog mistakes about that object. And we'll fight each other. And if you remain in those field of opposites, there's no escape. That's called samsara. So hope I'm communicating to you all. I'm going to beg, ask you, plead. If you have a camera, turn it on so I can see your faces. That way I'm just talking to a screen and it's boring for me. Can I please see your faces? Try. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. It's so much better if I can see your faces. Thank you. So Buddhists would say, oh, the, you know, this five parts is another beautiful list from these practices, but it says any creature with a mind that wants to wake up that mind from normal to extraordinary to buddha to woke up yeah uh will have to travel through broadly speaking these five paths and it's vital to know because there's a point in these paths where we flip from normal to actually knowing with certainty that what we're doing will create a difference in our reality and i want to share with you this word called 
Hlungdruk, Hlungdruk. It's a Tibetan word for what a Buddha, an enlightened creature, experiences as they are being naturally. So if you imagine the possibility that your mind has zero suffering, never again, nothing disturbs your mind. Instead, you are completely engaged with all of reality without exception, and everything gives you bliss beyond any bliss you've ever realized. This is to wake up to Buddha. Yeah, you experience everything and everything is more than a pen, never a chew toy. It's extraordinary. And you have this thing, hungdruk, this uh, habituated projection of reaching every single creature that has a mind. You perceive yourself reaching out to everyone, appearing in front of everyone as exactly what they need to move forward in their own awakening. So Buddhists are hanging out in their own Buddha realities going, I'm blissed out, dude, and dudesses to all the other Buddhas who have reached that same So it's like, isn't life awesome? And then there's all of us crawling around trying to get happy, making mistakes along the way, thinking getting happy by taking things from other people is going to get us happy and it creates more suffering. And Buddhas are sitting there going, since I'm outside of time and space and I can perceive all things, I'm going to go and reach out and sit next to Kamaya today and I'm going to be a breeze across her neck and she'll think something beautiful if she notices or Sydney or I'll be in, I'll be the food inside Sachi and John's bowl at the moment. And as they chew on it, they're like, hmm, that reality thing that some, some, so a Buddhist basically are sitting there. The, the result of a Buddha is that they're sitting there experiencing themselves. Their minds are projecting a reality for them, a real thing, not bullshit imaginary, a reality of seeing everything and everyone in it and being the perfect match, the perfect match for everyone. And since they're outside of time, they don't mind waiting 20 years to meet you on the subway. They don't mind being the annoying lady who screamed at you at the counter because when she screamed at you, you tried not to scream back and you just planted the karma that will prevent you from screaming back in the future. So they, they'll wait, they'll hang out. So imagine that as the result. How the hell do we get to that state? Assuming because minds are empty of a nature, they don't have to be a human broken samsaric mind that's traumatized and suffering and going through aging. It doesn't have to be that way. It's like the pen, it's empty of a nature. And so these paths really help you figure out where you are along the way of that awakening. Yeah. So imagine that being able to be the perfect match for everyone, you know, the blanket for the person that's cold, the lover for the lonely, the food for the hungry, to be able to imagine yourself appearing next to everyone that needs it. That's and, and knowing with certainty you're, you're, you're doing it for real, as real as you think this is. Yeah, that's Buddha, right? So you've got to think, what's a Buddha like? So before getting there, we're just schmucks, right? I call this pre-path. We're in this evolutionary uh, obsession with iPhones, and we're just zombies. Like enough, enough addiction to the senses will turn us into zombies. But, you know, unthinking through reality will just turn us into zombies. So this is pre-path. But then hopefully, if you're like the most of us, You'll have some tragedy, some horrible problem, something that hurt your heart, something that made you question normal, something that made you go, oh, it, I don't want it this way anymore. I'm sick and tired of breaking up. I'm sick and tired of negative self-talk. I'm sick of, or, or I should have been kinder to my mum before she died. Some, some tragedy, something will force itself on your mind and beg you to question whether you're doing the right thing with this precious human life. And that impulse, we talked about it last course, can lead us to renunciation, meaning I'm, I don't want normal anymore. F normal. F it. There's got to be another way. And your mind is inquisitive, engaged, and not depressed, right? It's like, I, I can't stand it for, for myself anymore. And hopefully you would have moved on to, I wish that for others as well. That's bodhicitta. That's another story, right? So you can go for either I want to wake up or I want us all to wake up. And you begin this thing called the path of accumulation. If you've come face to face with reality and at some point you will, if you haven't already, at some point, 
some tragedy will happen yeah or some beautiful thing will begin slipping away and you're like no that career i had my beauty my hair yeah if you're attached to your hair and you get this renunciation you're like oh and what about all the other people with hair so you, you start this path of accumulation and if you're lucky if your heart is already slightly kind you begin to investigate how to make things really work not not accept normal, that you stop giving up on the way things could be and you start actively engaging in what you understand is possible. Real freedom, real joy, real love. You don't close down, you open up. And that begins this thing called the path of accumulation. You get renunciation, you start investigating reality, but mostly it's called accumulation because you begin to accumulate good karmas, good imprints, the causes that begin to wake you up. And I'll just give you a quick summary for this path of accumulation, right? If karma and emptiness is true and you have to figure it out, then everything you do, say, and think will be forced upon your reality. So you want to be forced to understand reality. So one of the karmas you want to accumulate, one of the virtues, one of the goodness is teach people whatever the hell you know that they need to understand. Teach everyone, teach everyone. Whatever you know, give it away. Get the act of giving, right? Just make sure other people get what they need to wake up a little. How, however far you've woken up, give it away. Start accumulating that virtue, that goodness in your mind, those seeds, by watching yourself, taking care of others. Give it away. Or, and you'll see all the weirdos that take care of free jewels, right? They're all selfish. They just want good karmas for themselves. They'll take care of a spiritual center, a place that gives goodness to other people, not because we like you, but because we want to accumulate good seeds in our own mind. Imagine having the seed every day that people that are volunteering at Three Jewels, running Three Jewels, putting these classes together, doing all the mechanics, paying the accountant, doing the tax, doing all the business stuff as a volunteer with the wish that someone else's mind wakes up. That's what people, that, all the people that you see obsessing about each other at Three Jewels, taking care of people, are trying to accumulate as much goodness for themselves and their friends because those karmas will pop and force themselves to, to create teachings for yourself. Does that make sense? Does it, yeah? You'll be forced to experience all the goodness that you're actively putting in. So the path of accumulation usually is take, find a teacher find someone that tells that teaches you a truth and whatever teacher you're reaching it feels weird saying it as a teacher but we don't have time i have to tell you the biggest karma you could have is connection to an authentic teacher or lineage because that'll keep you awake then find a teacher or create the courses for finding a teacher by teaching other people obsess about reality find out don't settle for normal Take care of other people that are trying to do that, like a spiritual center or something like that. Serve that teacher as if they are the Buddha or whatever you need to do to plant those seeds for you. It doesn't matter whether they like you, they think you're smelly and you're following them around. It doesn't matter if you're weird. In your mind, you plant your karmas because you reap those things, right? So that's all the path of accumulation. It's like winding a toy that will propel you through this path because it ain't easy to get out of the orbit of normal we're stuck addicted to the orbit of normal you'll all at some point give up being in love after a while instead of as love begins to fade and you got your fifth relationship you're like ah oh, just humans but love was there as a possibility what will you do to keep it going not just for you but for others the same for self-esteem the same for hope right so it Anyway, path of accumulation. Everyone that needs to get out of the orbit of normal will have some kind of, I'm sick and tired, let's wake up and create the courses for that. That leads us to the path of preparation. Sorry, Sabrina, you've got to do that. Yeah. Which is you begin to prepare, go deeper and deeper in your study of reality. And we'll cover that today. Sabrina, can you move it? Yeah, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, this path of preparation really has a lot to do with understanding emptiness as best as you can and the causes for emptiness. You still keep accumulating good karma. You still, you're still taking care of 
the people that need to be taken care of, you have a teacher, et cetera, et cetera. But you're now preparing your mind. There's like four stages in the stage of uh, the path of preparation. You're preparing your mind to have an experience of the ultimate, to see emptiness directly. So the summary of the path of preparation is you're studying your ass off, you're meditating your ass off, and you're working at the, as the deepest level you can possibly get to, to understand how karma and emptiness work to create your experience of reality, to create pen for you instead of chew toy or instead of something else. And so in the path of preparation, you climb this obsession you have with understanding reality with the fuel of what got you through the path of accumulation. You're preparing to have a direct communion, a direct experience, not an intellectual one anymore, a direct experience of emptiness. And this is called the path of seeing, seeing emptiness directly. That path is short. It's not really a path. It's basically the result of all the accumulation you've done and all the service and taking care of all the karmas are popping together, as well as the karma of deep investigation of the nature of reality, the path of preparation. Am I making sense to you all? Yeah, is that, I'm trying to put words that are meaningful. So we're sick and tired of normal. We're like, it's gotta be another way. Oh, look, this reality, ultimate reality is a thing. I better build up the karmas to make that happen. Take care of people, find a teacher, keep meditating, investigating until you get more and more subtle understanding. At this point, at the path of preparation, you wanna understand this thing called Chi Chedrak and I'll cover it a little bit in a second. It's like the way we work with mental images, mental constructs and how we are tricked by them. Yeah, so we'll cover it a little bit. And then if you've done that work and you've been serving people and you've, you've really been working single pointedly focused to try and break normal and you are meditating, you know how to bring your mind to stillness. In that stillness, because of all that thing, your mind will force you to have a direct perception of emptiness if you know how to meditate on emptiness. And that direct perception doesn't even have words. They say it's like water poured into water. Yeah, you can't put words on it. You're, you're subsumed by the experience. So much so that everything disappears. Time disappears. You have no conception of any of that until that time is done. Could be, they say, 15, 20 minutes of a profound awakening in meditation. You don't even know you've had it until you come down that's called Jetob Yeshe. You come down from the direct perception of emptiness and you begin to realize, oh my God, I just saw something ultimate. I saw something capital R reality. All that stuff I've been studying, the, the, the diamond metaphor is cut by that experience, the diamond cutter. The experience I had in the direct perception of emptiness in meditation, because I've accumulated and prepared and meditated and served, my mind popped and saw, got a window into reality. And it's like opening up a window to the entire universe and time. And then because of the habit of having life after life of normal, that window closes. And you are back into this kind of human perception. Yeah. This normalness appears back at you as if it's coming this way, like the pen. Yeah. And then you enter what's called the path of habituation, where all the detailed Buddhist practices happen, but they have a completely different meaning. Before the path of seeing, we're being kind, we're studying emptiness, we're studying kindness, we're doing bodhicitta, we're serving, we're bloody do-gooders, but we don't really know what we're doing. At the path of seeing, when you actually have that communion, and you come out of that, you come down, you still do all the same practices, but all of a sudden you're like, I know with absolute certainty the reality that exists beyond the appearance, beyond the illusion. And so you don't believe the lie anymore. You'll have an object that appears to you as a pen. You're like, oh my God, there is this thing called, I used to call a pen. I know exactly what produced that. There isn't pen there. In fact, my behavior towards that pen or that person will now create my awakening and after that path of habituation which takes some time you then enter the last or the result called the path of no more learning 
Oh, Hundro. This, this, ah. Uh, it's like an inertia, like you, you exist. And like I started this inertia that you just reach out to everyone that has the ear to hear you. And you could be sitting on a train for 20 years waiting for someone to pop in and say the right thing. And that will divert their reality to freedom. So that these, I, I don't know, am I covering enough of that? Is that, is that what we agreed I should cover in this yeah. short time? I would say while the slide is here, screenshot it if you need and just remember a P S H. You're going to see those icons. The rest of the slide. Yeah, whatever, whatever acronym you need. But really, acute pack, accumulation, preparation, seeing, habituation, and not just as words, but the flavor that stuck with you from what Victor just shared. Because everything else from today, all the homework questions, all the other slides, are pertaining to a particular one of these packs. And you'll see it as a little icon on the slide. So just remember that A P S. -H. And so one of the doors to emptiness, should I move on? Yeah, one of the doors to emptiness um, is this idea of chi jedrak. Chi, C-H-I, and jedrak, J-E-D-R-A-K. This is like one of the most subtle, important, logical insights into the nature of things and it gets trippy and you ain't gonna get it today you're just gonna get a flavor okay but we're gonna give you links to classes and readings and videos for you to spend time doing this uh kedrup j i think said so. kedrup j was one of jason kappa's main students he said someone that wants to see emptiness directly and doesn't want to study chi Jedrak is like a hungry person saying they don't like food. I think that's what he said, right? It's like Hector saying, I want to lose weight, but I'm not going to the gym. <laughs> Sorry, that's my own joke at myself. Um, but it really is that someone that wants to have this profound experience, the only thing worth having on this planet, if you want to know how to maintain love, if you want to know how to maintain bliss, joy, understand what happens to your mind after death and the rest, we have to have, first of all, an intellectual understanding of emptiness. And secondly, a direct perception of emptiness. And then we are home free. Then all these other Buddhist practices, bloody do good activity makes sense. Without that, we're just doing stuff. Nice stuff. We'll have nice result, but the result will wither like everything else unless it's done with wisdom, emptiness, and then it doesn't have to stop. And that's the key. Yeah? So I wanna cover a little bit about this Chi Jedrak. And I want you to think of Chi as a general or general Chi and Jedrak as specific to that general or quality Chi and characteristic of that quality Jedrak. Can you get those two terms right? So Jedrak is a subset of Chi. Does that make sense? Like Chi is car and Ford is a Jedrak of that Chi. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's a whole study. That's books and books and meditations on this thing called Chi Jedrak. There's four types of Chi. One is a Rig Chi, which is like a type, like I just said, car and subsets of cars yeah and the second one which is vital and important is dunchi which is a a mental image yeah and then drachi is another mental image when when we give you the readings and we give you the thing you can geek out on all this stuff it's like almost infinite the amount of of information you can get but what i need you to get tonight is that there's this chi, which Carl Jung would have called it an archetype. Yeah, uh, there is a mental image, a dunchi. There's a mental image of a thing. Let's say clock. Yeah, there's a mental image of clock, not a clock, not the clock, not some clock, but clock. Yeah. 
there's this archetype in your mind that whenever you see an object that can be subsumed by that archetype, whenever you see a clock or the clock, that jedrak for that chi, it's subsumed in there. Just so far, does that make sense? Those concepts. We have archetypes, chi's in our minds, constructs that we look around our reality and things fit into those constructs. And our brains are wired to observe reality that way. That's what prejudice is. <laughs> oh, you're that type of person. You've just jedracked a human. Yeah? That's what humans are. <laughs> a consciousness perceiving this kind of reality with this many arms and this capacity to think, oh, you're a jedrak of this human. Because puppies are not. They've got four of these things. So they don't fit the archetype. And so if you really want to investigate, this is vital, 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 vital. Our minds are doing this this fast. We're observing, we're getting data. And that data is being put together and forced into some chi, some archetype, some uh, quality. Yeah. Oh, that's characteristic of this thing. That's characteristic of this thing. And so if you're going to do anything with this chi jedrak thing from today on, obsess about the difference between, oh, there's a car. And you know that a car is fitting somewhere into an archetype of car, carness, humanness, that kind of person-ness. It's got some nature to it. We think so. And to cut to the chase, do, are you understanding what I'm saying or is it too weird? Okay, good. We're doing this nonstop. We're doing it subconsciously. That's all we do. We, we, we don't stop and analyze everything because our brains would explode. We don't have the mental capacity to differentiate between data that's being experienced and what our minds are doing to push it into some archetype chi yeah so we're forever chi jedracking our world everything and we're doing it about ourselves as well i'm just that kind of person my mind just did that thing and to cut to the chase there's lots of debate about this get this please yeah we mistake we constantly mistake the experience or the jedraks we're experiencing for the mental image you have a mental image of this phone appearing to your senses and your mind is jedracking this into a chi of phone in your mind. And you're not really seeing this thing for what it is at the moment. It's all cracked up and screwed up and it's got bad design. You're not watching that. You're seeing a wonderful, perfect construction of your archetype of phone when this object appears in front of you. And your mind is doing it this way, this fast. And it works most of the time until you're dead. And if you want to be not dead, <laughs> you can understand how your mind is creating even dead upon a bunch of sensory experiences that we call dying. That's just to stretch it a little further. So obsess about the difference between a thing and the thing and thing. Clock, a clock, the clock child the child a child what is childness what what is required for a jedrak to be fit into your archetype and if you understand that you'll come to this point if you obsess about it it'll hurt your head but you'll come to this point where you begin to see dependent origination intellectually at first you're like oh my god there's some data i can see my mind trying to force that data into an archetype and I believe the archetype, I'm ignoring the data now. And when you begin to obsess about that, you'll see how your mind is constantly fabricating, projecting your archetype on reality. And you're not having an experience of reality. And that's the key to understanding how the reality is empty of a nature. And all we're ever lost in is our, our dunchis, our mental images. And if you want to know what that feels like, go to my TED talk 
how to get rid of an angry boss and we'll put it there and spend 11 minutes listening to that or there's four videos from Geshe Michael Raj explaining this way better than me and for much longer. Yeah, so th I think that's what I've got to say about the key to emptiness. You've got to understand how mental images are tricking you into thinking you're experiencing something when you're only experiencing your archetypes. Can I ask a quick question? Who's that? Danielle, yeah, go. Um, this reminds me a lot of like in psychology, what's called confirmation bias which is basically seeing things or viewing people or events um, in a way that confirms how you want to see them or how you're familiar with seeing them. Um, so this kind of reminds me of that. Follow that lure, meditate on it so much until you come to the realization that there is no bias at all existing in the objects you're biased towards there's nothing there's no nature in them and if that's true you choose your biases and why choose shitty ones when you can choose divine ones that's the power of transformation that's the wake up there's no nature in everything around you therefore the nature that appears is what's forced upon you by your past actions therefore you act to create the right jedrex and cheese. So Priya, it's all yours. Cool, thank you so much. Every time I hear T Jedrak teaching, well, it really depends. It depends on my karma. Sometimes it feels like, like the tectonic plates of my universe are shifting. I'm like, oh, whoa, I didn't realize things were that way. And sometimes it's like, oh God, here's the T Jedrak thing again. Like, you know, here's that list again. So it, if I were you, catch your mind, how are you relating to this? because they say that this is the key, right? We're talking path of preparation right now. This is the key, like Hector was saying, that winds you up, that would then force you, right? Not by will, you can't sit there in meditation and will yourself to experience emptiness directly. Otherwise we all would. But by loading up our minds with this very concept, creating the causes to actually force an experience called the path of seeing or the direct perception of emptiness which is where we're moving next, but to a very specific part of that. So if you remember that image of the five paths, remember when Hector pointed out Jetop Yeshe? It was like the dotted line after the path of seeing. I'm seeing some nods. So this is Jetop Yeshe translates to subsequent wisdom. Or think about it as the wisdom that appears in your mind after the direct perception of empty. Yeah, I was asked at a job interview the other day, um, Supriya, what's your superpower? And my immediate answer was, oh, my superpower is that I can meditate. And, you know, I, I followed that up with some reasons why. But in my mind, what I was thinking about was Jetop Yeshe. The day this experience happens and I get to experience these subsequent wisdoms, these Arya truths, often mistranslated as the noble truths, the four noble truths, you might've heard that. Those, it's really like having superpowers, they say. For 24 hours, those are in your mind. And, and you'll see when we go through them, they, they feel like the best superpowers you could have. So that's what we're talking about here. The end of the path of seeing. Why are they called the four Arya truths? Why not the four noble truths, right? It's a mistranslation. There's nothing noble about experiencing reality ultimately and directly. Right, But what it does, Hector alluded to this, it actually changes the type of being that you are. With certainty now, these things that you've been simply hearing about intellectually or exploring intellectually for real, you have complete confirmation, right? That bias has for completely flipped in your mind as a certainty for you. And you actually become a different type of being, they say. It's like stepping onto a conveyor belt that is one track out of samsara, extreme enterer or Arya, someone who's directly perceived this ultimate reality. That's why these are called the four Arya truths. Yeah, not the four noble truths. And we're gonna go through them, but I'd like you to think of them. I'd like you to ask yourself, like, where did these come from, right? Did someone sit there and, and fabricate these out of nowhere? Let me come up with another list of four. 
this Tibetan Buddhism doesn't have enough, right? I mean, think about the most beautiful aha moments you've ever had. Or like, I just felt this, I was on the subway on the way here, I looked up and if anyone's seen the moon tonight, at least in New York, it's like this, it felt like this thumbprint in the sky. Like it took my breath away. And the only thing I can do, right, is try to put words to that real experience for me. Same thing here. You have this ultimate experience of reality. You can't even put it into words. So you categorize it into four things, which is actually a list of at least 16 things that you categorize, right? But if we were to summarize the four Arya truths, in essence, what are they? You can actually break them up into two truths, two very simple truths. The first one, life is indeed as forked up as it seems. It's true. If you've ever had that sense, uh, what does everyone else know that I don't know? Like what's going on here? There's gotta be something. I remember having that sense very strongly about a few weeks you know, before I stumbled into three jewels of like, what am I missing? What's going on? How is everyone just keeping their head down and going through life? Why aren't we talking about the fact that we're going to die? Why aren't we talking about the fact that nothing seems to work out? But for some people, things do seem to work out. So life, is, there's a problem. There's something weird going on that's suspicion. That's really the first half of these truths. And then, like Hector said, not to get pulled down into pessimism there or wallow, that there's actually a way out. Like there's a way that in seeing that messed upness, in, in that act itself, there's a key. That there's a way to completely eliminate that messed upness, not just for me, but for everyone else. That's the second half. It's really that. So we're going to go into the details. Again, I invite you to screenshot this next time you're in one of those annoying icebreakers where you have to share your preferred superpower. You can select from this list of more than 16. So these are really the four Arya truths. The first one you might have heard as the truth of suffering, right? Or all those life is suffering memes. Here you go. It's the Arya truth of suffering. And it's saying, regardless of whether you're on a good trip right now or a high right now, acknowledge that that will change. Or if you're in a kind of dip right now, acknowledge that that will change as well. Inside every single experience in life, there's a self-destruct button in the way I'm interacting with my life right now. As I was negotiating my job offer for a startup, I was, we were talking about how much money I would get when the startup ended and got sold. Within that, right, within the startup conversation, we were talking about how will it end up? The self-destruct button is there and it's in every single experience. You logged onto the Zoom knowing that it's gonna come to an end. If that's not suffering enough for you, name someone who you haven't had to see or will not have to see go through the experience of dying. There's, and then there's lists of the types of suffering, but here you go. And this one actually, I think is most uh, pertinent. I was thinking about it when I was walking through Soho on Black Friday and I tried for a second to think, what if I could read everyone's minds? You know, like what if there's a little monitor above everyone's minds and it just really, like what we think social media is, it actually spelled out their thoughts. And the Arya truth are telling us that that's actually a type of suffering. Like if we realize the chaos that's in all of our minds all the time and how much we trip over our own selves trying to get happy, that that's actually a type of suffering to really consider that. Yeah, I'm seeing some nods. So that's Arya truth of suffering. It gets better though, right? Because you can understand something crucial about that suffering, which is the fact that it is caused. And if something is caused, it's a changing thing. It's something that came into existence, which definitionally means that it can go out of existence. It is not a permanent thing that just popped up suffering. No, there's a whole truth devoted to the fact that there is a cause of suffering. And that cause is actually something in my own mind. It's a mistake I didn't know I was making, right? It is me jedrocking cheese. 
Am I saying that right? I think so, yeah. Jedracking all the cheese, all the different types of cheese. Um, right, at, at its core, what it is, is I'm going around thinking that my world is asserting itself on me this way, that the power exists outside of me. And because of that mistake, right, because I think people who don't agree with me are wrong, I do something. I put something into motion. I either say something I will regret, I do something, or most lethal, I think something in my mind that cements that bias. It cements that chedrock to achieve. I'm thinking, I, yeah, something like that. It's that process, what that puts into momentum without even realizing it, I am creating suffering. That's it, cause of suffering, seeing things as self-existent, right? Existing from their own side. And here, this one's important. This actually, I remember this. This was also a few weeks before I found the Dharma. I remember what side of the L train I was sitting on. And I was so trapped in my own mind and my own pain. And I remember having this thought of, I wonder if I classified all the thoughts in my mind, like a pie chart. I'm a little bit of a nerd that way. And I thought, how many of those thoughts are about me versus others? And it horrified me. It horrified me. I was like, it's at least 99%. That even in the most sweet, kind moments of my life, what I was really thinking, there was a part of my mind which is like, oh, cool, are they noticing how good I am? And it, it shook something in me. That can't be the point of this life. And, and that is part of the cause of suffering, realizing for real, and Arya has this sense that up until this moment, I've only ever had selfish thoughts or self-serving thoughts. And they recognize that for real. Now, the story gets better. I'm gonna move faster through the second two Arya truths. There is an end of suffering in the same way that things, anything that is caused, it can become uncaused. If you simply remove the things that caused it in the first place, the conditions that caused it in the first place. So it's possible to end suffering and that happens only during, it's that key that you're turning during the direct perception of emptiness. Everything else up until then, path of accumulation, path of preparation, it's great, but they say it's like a band-aid. It's like a band-aid on a giant gaping wound. And the only thing that's for sure healing absolutely everything is that direct experience of the ultimate. Lots of things there. You can, you can get more in the reading and the notes. I'm not going through all the details, but this last part, and we're gonna talk about this more, is the truth of the path. The fact that to go from understanding the cause of suffering to completely unwinding it, there's stages involved. There's, there's things I have to do. Like Hector said, I have to find a teacher that I can relate to, and then I need to serve them, right? Serving them doesn't mean Sometimes I get lost and I think serving my teacher means getting them dulce de leche ice cream every time I see them. <laughs> That's not, it's how am I relating to them in my mind? How am I relating to my one vehicle that if I hook onto them, they could propel me out of samsara because of something in my own mind. It's studying. It's studying chi jadrak even though it hurts your brain, right? It's serving, it's finding a place that you think is allowing other people to have these realizations and becoming a barnacle on that ship. It's doing the six perfections. It's doing your vows. All the things that come in Buddhist practice, they are in this last Arya truth of the path. Anything else here? And, it and here's where they talk about also the direct perception of bodhicitta. What if for real you could see every single person's face in the universe and in that instant love them in the way that you love the person that you love most in the world right now. That's also part of the path. For real, if you want complete enlightenment, not just nirvana and hanging out, no mental afflictions for myself. Okay, I need to move quickly through this because we have a, we have a fun um, breakout room activity. So remember, we're in the Diamond Cutter Sutra. Here's a conversation between the Buddha and a student of his. And he's actually recounting this story. And it has to do actually with this path out, right? Part of the path out is saying, I will use every single experience that comes my way and transform it into the path. 
good stuff, that's easier, right? You can say, oh, great, good stuff's happening. I'm going to cash in, share it with others, keep generating that karma. What about the negative stuff? What about the hard stuff? So the Buddha recounts this story of this is supposedly some previous lifetime where a king was literally butchering, cutting off his limbs. He says, at that moment, there came into my mind no conception of a self, nor of a sentient being, nor of a living being, nor of a person. I had no conception at all. Enter Diamond Cutter Sutra Flare, but neither did I not have a conception. What's going on there, right? Does anyone else remember? To get to enlightenment, you must bring all sentient beings with you, right? But when you get there, there's no beings you brought at all. So remember, this is all coded. No beings from their own side at all, right? No conceptions coming this way from the torture. So he goes on. I did have a conception of some sentient being, some living being, some person. It did come into my mind. And because of that, the thought to harm someone would have come into my mind as well. Forget the fancy words. Really think about it. If you were tied down and having your limbs cut off, what would you, would you have a thought of here is me, here is my body experiencing pain, here is some other being doing this pain to me? Very simply, that's the scenario we've laid out. Now, the question comes. The Buddha, is supposed, right, Buddhists are uh, very patient. It's probably something you've heard. This perfection of patience, just like the perfection of giving. The question is, did the Buddha have a perception of pain in that moment? And I gave you the answer here, but it should, it should come up in your mind. It is the point of being a Buddhist that in that moment you would just numb out, right? I can withstand any pain. I can doormat myself and just take it. That is not what we're talking about here. The answer is yes. He absolutely felt pain. And at the same time, he knew for sure that the elements of this entire situation were karma, were projections being forced on the blank screen of reality, right? He was spitting out a reality created by his own past deeds. I must have hurt someone in the past and maybe I didn't chop off their hand. Maybe I just gave them a paper cut, but karma grows. It doubles every day. So the, the teaching here, hopefully this is reminiscent of the three spheres of giving. It applies to the three spheres of patience as well, right? The perfection of patience. The king himself, empty of a nature from his own side. He's not an evil being hacking off limbs from his own side. The emptiness of the act of patience, this thing I call hurt, some people are into that kind of pain. It's not pain for them. <laughs> Let's just say that. And the emptiness of the recipient, of me, myself, because do I exist in this arm? Right? If I were really to cut this arm off and put it in the middle of the room, is Supriya in that arm? If that's not the case, so what is this thing that's really getting cut off? So the emptiness of all those things in that moment and the implication of that, right? It's not just about seeing things as empty, seeing what they are not, but also what are they, right? In that moment, the way I relate to them is creating what they are. Other side, karma, emptiness, two sides of the same coin. Can't think of one without the other. So here, and this is relevant to our breakout room activity. How do you break the cycle of making the mistake, reaping the results of the mistake, making the mistake, reaping the results of the mistake? Let's say in a scenario like this, like getting your arms cut off by the king of Kalinka, right? Why did the Buddha not respond with hatred in that moment? Key crux of the, of the thing here being the Buddha is not a normal being. He had this experience on the path of seeing called the direct perception of emptiness. So he has no doubt in his mind that the hurt is coming at him and rather that he is creating this whole experience. And because of that, he knows for sure, we know for sure that responding in the same way, responding with anger, hurt, all it's doing is putting a snowball effect into motion to create more kings of Kalinkas in the future. The very impulse that I have creates the thing I'm trying to get away from for an untrained mind, right? But here we're talking about the path of habituation. You've had that deep experience, but reality just reasserts itself, right? It's like when you come back from a vacation and your mind's all shiny and clear, and then you're like, oh wait, 
things are starting to crumble again. It just asserts itself. It doesn't matter how hard you try, but you can't shake the fact that no, this doesn't have to be the way things are. So act of truth, an act of truth is saying, here is a cycle of samsara. You thought samsara was some big grand cycle or some wheel you're caught in? No, it is the tiny interactions moment to moment of responding mistakenly to things that seem to be outside of you, rather than with the wisdom that I create absolutely everything. So an act of truth in this case is not to respond with hatred to the king cutting off your arms. And actually, if you could dare to respond with love, to remember I caused this moment. And the only way I can ensure that it doesn't happen again is to wipe from my mind completely hatred, violence, anger. It's like a sun coming up in a sky of stars. Where do the stars go? So with that, for the next 20 minutes, so till nine o'clock, we're gonna do breakout rooms. You're used to this if you've come to this class before. And we're actually asking you to get a bit vulnerable and personal with this. I mean, you don't have to, you could just say anything, but remember the result of what you discuss and share in that group, you're gonna get. So as open as you can be, uh, someone said they out of this course, they want more magic moments in their life. You might get more magic moments just the more you're able to open up. And what we're asking you to do Introduce yourself, especially where you're coming from. And with as much openness as you can, share something personal that you're struggling with right now. I just broke up with someone. I can't figure out what I wanna do with my life. I'm broke and I, nothing's coming my way. Whatever it is, your current quandary, your current problem, and see if you can first identify what's your, what would be your old way of responding to it? Or what are you trying right now to get yourself out of that situation? And then see if you can dare to declare an act of truth, like the Buddha loving the king of Kalinka as he cuts off his arms. What would an act of truth be to break the cycle of making the mistake, getting caught in this mini samsara over and over again, and actually get you on a conveyor belt out in a different direction? Hint, it has something to do with karma and emptiness. Yeah, so that is the next 20 minutes. I'm going to enable chatting. You can discuss amongst yourselves, get to know each other. I hope you're with some randos. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Everyone, breakout room. So see you at nine o'clock. And if, you're, uh, if you've done this class uh, at Three Jewels, let uh, Sapria look to place you in a group with people so everyone gets yeah. Someone that's gone through this once. Thanks for that, Sapria. Yeah, <laughs> is the prompt clear? Yeah. Okay, amazing. So if you've done ACI six or seventeen before, stay here. Everyone else, have fun. Boom. Okay. Hello. Okay, let's go. Mackenzie, you can join room one. Ming and Lena, you can join. Kelly, I'm going to move you to room two because they don't have anyone seasoned. Sachi and John Chris and Steven, you can join and Javier. Or sorry, Sachi and John Chris are already there. So Steven and Javier, you join room four. Anthony's room leading room five. Well, room six is stacked. I need to divide some of you up. Sam, I'm gonna move you to room seven. Sam, I'll get her to do the prompt on the thing after. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yes, I will do that. All right. And so Miriam and Rachel can join. Sarah, I'm moving you. Elizabeth and Hannah can join as well as Leah. I, and actually, 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 Elizabeth, if you haven't gone yet, I wanna move you to, oh no, you already went. Hannah, Beinecke family, don't move. I'm putting you in room two, perfect. 
Sarah, you're good. Danielle and Hannibal, you're good to join. Santi, you're good. Gabriel, where are you? You're good? You can join, you can join, yeah, perfect. Maya, what group does it say you wanna to go to? I can't see you. 10. Is that where you're from? I didn't realize that. Okay, 10 works. Yeah, 10 works, you'll give Santi some company there. Thank you. Sam, you're good to join. I'm still in yeah. room six. Did you want me in room seven? Oh. Yes, please, because already Rachel and Miriam are there. Perfect. I'm putting you in seven. Thank you. I'm pausing recording. And also, can you make me I had a hard time um, figuring out what the act of truth was because it felt very complicated. And um, as we were talking through it, Santi shared a story that I thought was really interesting and kind of applied to everybody's group. And that was um, in dealing with a difficult client, Santi decided to use a plant as a surrogate and named a plant after this person that was being very difficult. And in, in caring for the plant kind of transformed the relationship with this difficult client. And so I, I mean, I thought it was, it was funny and also applicable to, to all of us and, you know, suggesting to the people who were having difficulty in the place that they were literally planting seeds physically mm -hmm. um, to root them where they, where they were, or, you know, naming, you know, a, a, something to, to, to care for um, in that place or, or with that person. So good, everyone to name and talk to their plants. That's the takeaway from this story. Thank you, thank you. And last group, please. I think I'm gonna share for our group, uh, group 10. We had a bunch of different stories, but the main theme and the main story that we picked out was about going from an expert to a novice in like a work situation mm. and then beginning to feel like jealousy for those people who are experts in that field or that topic or whatever um and what do you do in that situation and we were discussing it and we were talking about how you could feel good about all of those people who know more than you and who are having success in that in that way that you want to be. So good, I love it. And we're gonna get more into the, the anti-jealousy attitude next class actually. The bodhisattva attitude is essentially the opposite of that. Like if, if even a hint comes into your mind of, oh gosh, I, I wish I had gotten that job promotion instead. Right? I wish I looked that good. It is the opposite of that. It is, it is instead, I wish every goodness unimaginable as enter as a stream into their heart now and forever. That's what you want for everyone. Forget the job promotions and the boyfriends. That attitude, actually having it and sustaining it is what makes you a bodhisattva. And it's, it's a thank you for that little uh, bridge into that's exactly the next topic that we go into starting Thursday. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen and let you take it away. Hector, we have just a little bit of content left. Here we go, give me a moment. Thanks everyone for sharing. Okay. So the bottom line here, I'll, I'll go really quick and we can talk about it in the in the review next week. But basically is we have because of karma and emptiness, because we've investigated Chichedrak and had the virtue that pushed us to understanding, we got to come to the realization that because things don't have a nature, 
because they are empty, they work. Not the opposite, which is what our tendency is. When we think emptiness, it means, oh, nothing exists. It's, the, it's wrong. Things are changing. Think you're having experiences of being jealous or trying not to be jealous for work. These are moments of your mind. These are the, the dunchies popping up in your mind that you in, misunderstand for reality. You want all the work to happen in there. It doesn't matter what's popping up. Yeah. So things that are changing are changing because they were caused. And that is your reality. And that's the essence of, of this thing. So you could try any method you want. You try this to fix that problem, or you try the opposite to fix that problem. That trying doesn't work without the understanding that there's a seed behind it, pushing you to have the experience. So you better get busy planting seeds if you understand that. And that is what reality is. There's no other reality. You can't pretend it's not a pen. It is a pen, but it's not a pen from its own side. It's for you a pen. It's not jealousy from its own side. It's for you jealousy. Yeah. And you can change that. Uh... I can jump in here if you like. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, because of yeah, that. Just, yeah, just to close it off, don't feel like that impulse of oh because things are empty nothing matters that's not a new thing like that's not that nihilistic worldview is not like a 21st century thing even 2500 years ago there was this debate between master Huashang and master kamala shila and for those of you who've taken aci3 applied meditation you might remember master Huashang. he's the guy who said yeah well in order to meditate you just clear your mind of everything right it just means emptying your mind you don't need to have an object so same guy, <laughs> he's, he's back. And now with the 700 debate- 700 AD, yeah, yeah. Sorry? 700 AD, roughly. Yeah, right around then. And, and, and now the debate is, okay, so what's the need for morality? If nothing is what it seems to be, things are empty of a nature, why does it matter that I'm good? And if you heard it in, in between the words Hector just said, it actually, everything matters even more than we think because we are the creators of, the, of, of absolutely everything. So don't be good because someone out in space is sitting with a karmic calculator keeping tabs on you. No, it's you keeping tabs on you. And the, and the, and the camera's always rolling. See, the karma cam is always on. You are recording absolutely everything, every thought, every hint of a thought, right? Every beginning, middle, and end of a thought and an impulse behind why you do the things you do. and. The theory is that that plants a seed in your mind that will have a result. Where else do things come from? They're empty of a nature from their own side. They don't have that essence in them. So exactly because the world is empty, like a blank screen, absolutely everything, morality should feel like the most liberating practice because it is the steps that you follow to transform absolutely everything. Right, because you're not the first one to want to have this experience. Someone has gone through these five paths. Many have. It's a repeatable process. It can be repeatable. And once they've gone through it, they've said, cool, you want to do it? You want to have this experience with the ultimate? Here's what you do. It's called vows. It can, it's called ethics. But it's not meant to bind us. It's not meant to be like, okay, thou shalt or thou shalt not. Right? It's meant to free us. And for a mind that's untrained, right? For a mind that's caught in the old way of doing things, it might feel restrictive at first, right? It might feel like there's no wiggle room or it might feel like it was designed for 2,500 years ago, but it doesn't apply to our modern context. And I hope, and we're gonna have a whole class about this, that you see the magic behind morality. And it's actually because of the fact that things are empty and that we are the karmic creators of absolutely everything that morality becomes your toolbox. It becomes your superpower. And it's absolutely necessary to transform right here, right now. You're not going anywhere. It's just that everything right here flips. Like just the story that Roy told about the toothbrush. That one thing, it just flipped. So that's all for today. Thank you for uh, digesting the fire hose. Couple of announcements, housekeeping. One, grade your own homework and quizzes, please, when you submit things. If you are going on that track, know that we will reject your coursework if it doesn't have a grade on it. 
And once it's rejected, you just have an option to resubmit, right? It should be pretty standard and think if it could pop up. Oh, your assignment got rejected. It was just because you didn't have a grade on it. Just resubmit. So thank you to our amazing Thinking Effect volunteers, Julia and Roxana and Ninon, who are taking care of all of this for you. All your assignments are being read by human eyes and human hearts and, and being inputted, but we need you to please put your grades on that. I'd like to also invite you all to the special Monday night meditation with Sarah Blackburn. Please flail your arms, Sarah, so everyone knows who you are. That's just for people in this course. So if Chi Jedrock hurt your brain, go to Sarah's class next Monday and ask her about it. It's specifically to meditate on things that matter, things that could actually turn into that direct experience of emptiness for us. So specific meditations for this course. Then this is really exciting. I hope you all can join on Thursday because we have a really special guest who's gonna come and do a short Q and A about an upcoming entirely digital retreat on the Medicine Buddha. And the motivation behind offering that retreat, and I'm not, uh, I'm not saying this to hyperbolize, it is to destroy the coronavirus in this world. That is the reason this retreat is being offered. Because if it's true that I'm seeing death and sickness and virus in my world, which I am, there must be a cause for it. And what's the, and, and, and I'm fooling myself if I think a vaccine is going to be the ultimate solution. It might take the form of a vaccine, but do I have the karma to see a vaccine function? Then I have to do some work inside really, really powerful work is this Medicine Buddha practice. So that's what the retreat is about. We'll do a whole Q&A at the end of class this Thursday. And um, I hope this is fitting. You can use your three spheres giving practice. If any of what you're, you're learning, experiencing, sharing in this, in this Dharma class or in any of our completely offered by free meditation or yoga classes is resonating with you, Consider what it would take to keep it going for you to see a three jewels stick around. So it's really not about the amount that you donate. We don't care. It's absolutely about the thought that's going through your mind as you click the donate button or as you tell your friend about these weird classes you come to on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So that's the last thing I'll say. We're really excited and hoping to exceed our goal of raising $50,000 with the old, our only intention is to keep doing what we're doing now and more in 2021 and beyond. Any, anything I missed there, Hector, before we dedicate? No, that's it. It's just um, once you understand what these classes are about, you get to create your future by the actions of body, speech, and mind. And so um, I love sharing these classes. Uh, I'd love it if you want to support Three Jewels. We're doing this drive until the end of the year. And like Supriya said, I don't care about the dollar amount. I think we'll be fine collectively. One buck towards keeping a center going that will help many people is a powerful karma to, to have, just the connection. I, I don't, I think that's good. And Medicine Buddha can't wait for that to start. Yeah. Can you close us out, please? And I know we're late and it's over time, but this, make this act an act of truth. What are you giving away now in this dedication? Maybe you could actually wish the direct experience of emptiness for absolutely everything. Am I doing it? Yes, please. Yep. Okay, here it goes. Give it away. Perfected world. Saji Fuki Jishin Metoktrum Rira Lingchi Nyundem Vadi Sange Shindu Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Nidhyatayami Gawadi Gawakun Sunam Yeshe Zogzokshin Sunam Yeshe Lejin Hui Dampa Kuni Dopar Thanks everyone for joining. Awesome examples. 
great focus. Welcome back. Let's finish this thing. I 